Welcome back to the Auto Blog Podcast. I'm Greg Migliori. We have an awesome show for you today. Lots going on in the car world. We've been driving some interesting things. Uh, we're going to talk about the BMW 330e. Byron and I have been in that car somewhat recently. Byron's in it right now. He's also going to talk about the Mercedes EQE sedan. And I'm going to bring home the Toyota Sienna. That's our newest long-termer. Uh, it's a very nice, nice minivan. Let's put it that way. So with that, going to go ahead and bring in associate editor Byron Hurd. Welcome aboard. Hello, hello. How you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. We have some sun today. It's like a totally different day than the rest of the week. Yeah, it's been a while. I we we just waited until March to have all of winter. It seems like, and yeah, it's driving me crazy. Like I, it, it, the backyard of my house now, like half of it is just bare grass, and the other half is just literally a line right down the middle. Doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But the other half is still inches of snow, and I yeah. it's it's it, it's like a, a perfect representation of what we've been dealing with here the past few weeks. It's funny. I got a text from the I'm using this new sprinkler guy, and I was like, "Hang on, dude. Uh, maybe we'll t- I'll see you in like three or four weeks. Like I'm not going to dewinterize these pipes just yet." Yeah, it's it's a little sketchy, but at least we're 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 finally turning that corner. It's nice to see the sun and be in daylight savings time, and actually feel like maybe spring's almost here. There's a spring like vibe in the year. The days are longer. It's been a little sunnier. It's, you know, it's nice, but uh, I'm not golfing. Let's put it that way. So a lot yeah. of the things that you might expect are not, have not quite happened yet. Let's put it yeah, that way. Definitely so, not quite patio weather yet. Not patio weather yet. Uh, cool. So we will spend your money. We've got uh, some features on this uh, Dodge Durango Hellcat owner who's suing Stellantis because. Uh, they're making too many of what they said was an allegedly limited edition. That's according to the suit, not my words, but we'll break what down what that means. And perhaps what it means for just some of these limited edition vehicles in general, as well as what is sort of a reservation crisis. If you want a certain kind of vehicle, it could be very tough to get right now, just given the supply chain inflations, how competitive it is to really buy anything like a house or a car. Uh, So we'll get into that a little bit, talk about the Kia EV9 and some news out of Rivian slash Amazon. So uh, with that, uh, let's talk about the 330e. You have been in it. I have been in it. Um, You know, again, there's a video. You should check that out uh, if you're kind of listening to this on the weekend. Uh, It's called the Autoblog Garage. So that was kind of like my closing uh, remarks, if you will, on the car. I did the video right before I handed it off. Uh, In general, I liked it. I like the fact that, um, you know, you can plug it in. I didn't like the fact that unless you have a level two charger at home, it's not super convenient and obviously doesn't charge super fast because there is no fast charging capability regardless. Um, But it's a very nice three series. It's fun to drive. I know you've spent some time in it. What, What did you think? So I've been enjoying it quite a bit, actually. It, it's interesting to me. It, it doesn't have quite as much power, but it reminds me a lot of that Volvo S60 T8 that we had a few years back as a long-termer, where it's it's a sporty-ish sedan, but it's not necessarily a full-blown sport model. The engine's a little coarse when it's running. Like it's it's you know it, it's a little rough around the edges, but I'm finding the hole to be very satisfying, especially since I do have a level two setup here. So. Plugging in has been great. I have yet to put fuel in the car because I don't need to, and I doubt I will for the for the duration of the time that I'll I'll have it with me unless I have to do a road trip. Mm. So you know, for the next few weeks, you know, driving to and from the airport, I'm about 15, 20 miles from it. I can just about make a full loop to and from the airport without using any gas, unless I actually get in the throttle a little bit. Which with the with the output of this, it's you know, it's again comparing it to the Volvo. The Volvo's total system power was around 400 horses, I think. Mm-hmm. This is down in the 260 range, I think, and so it's it's not nearly as potent. But it, the electric motor is very punchy. It's quiet, and even in the snow, we've this is one of the I'm I think one of the first people to actually get to play with this thing on snow tires. And with the combination of all wheel drive and the the Nokians. That thing was virtually unstoppable. We got a good five, almost six inches of really nasty, heavy, wet snow about two weeks ago now. And I, the first thing I did was like, yeah, I've got the Jeep on the on the big, like all terrain snow tires, but let's try the BMW first. Let's see if it can handle the rutted, nasty roads, given that it only sits a couple inches off the ground. And it was an absolute 
monster just plowing right through the snow like it wasn't even there you know probably leaving like weird little trails behind me it was it was fun the neighbors were looking at me funny as i was driving around all the fallen branches and everything like that and people coming out telling me oh don't go down that road i got stuck there's a tree down there don't go down this road i did the whole neighborhood basically in a grid just to like you know go out see the sites figure out if anybody had lost power see if anybody needed help getting dug out and that little thing was absolutely unstoppable so it's been great i've been uh, appreciating the electric flexibility so far and I think that's probably going to be the the theme of it as we uh, as we round this up because I don't think we're going to have it with us too much longer at this point. Just a couple more months. Yeah, yeah. And you just to be clear, you do have a level two charger at home, right? Yep. Yeah. It makes the difference. Yeah. Which is yeah, it's great. And of course, the the BMW has its own one ten, so I just leave yep. that in the car in case I end up someplace where I can plug it into mm -hmm. a, a regular one ten outlet. So far, that actually hasn't really come into play, mostly because. Whatever destination I get to, I usually still have a charge and it's, you mm -hmm. know, if I'm shopping or something like that, then, you know, I'm not I'm not looking for a plug in a strip mall. But if it's a, a larger destination or something like that, it's handy to have that, too. Yeah, I um, my one like challenge is when I went to uh, a local Meyer, uh, one in kind of it's Royal Oak, I think they actually didn't have the right chargers for the 330E, which I thought was kind of weird. They had like Tesla's, they had other fast chargers. So to me, in some ways, what was a very forward-looking car when they launched it, to me, is already starting to feel a little bit like, oh, maybe like it's a little bit moving past its time, um, if you will. I mean, to go to the snow part, though, I agree with you completely. I drove this thing. I had it from late November, I want to say, until like early February, probably, maybe January, somewhere in there. So I spent like winter in this thing. And... It was, you know, I mean, it was great. I actually think unless the snow is particularly challenging, being low to the ground, I think, can actually help you with all wheel yeah. drive and snow tires, you know. So, yeah, it was a, it was a sled. Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, like this car, the, the paint on it's beautiful. You'd hate to beat it mm -hmm. up too bad. But I mean, if you put some like nice, you know, protective film on the front bumper, you don't even have to worry about plowing like it, it with a good set of snow tires. It just goes. The one thing I did think was was interesting was trying to get the the traction control systems and everything to behave in a way that felt normal to me with the mm. electric torque involved because one thing i noticed like leaving all the nannies on if you just went out and gunned it in the snow pretty much nothing would happen because the the electric torque the computer's trying to modulate it so aggressively so that you don't just sit and spin or kick the tail out even with the all-wheel drive so it the ability of the ECU to really control how much torque you get to the wheels really becomes magnified by EVs because there's no sound to it. Like you just, you're not hearing the throttle being modulated. You're not, you know, there's, there's really no feedback telling you what exactly is going on, but the car is just ever so quietly finding traction at all four corners and then just kind of saying, okay, we're there. And then it lets you have as much as you want and you go. And as you dial back on the nannies, you can tell that they had to be kind of careful just because of the instant torque of the electric motors because you don't want it to snap on you. Because mm. that's it's, it would be like, you know, like experiencing turbo lag in a very weird situation where you've got nothing, nothing, nothing. And then suddenly you've got all that torque. And that's not great if you don't have have traction in all four corners. So it's it's interesting to see how delicate of a dance that can be, but I'm, I'm really impressed with how well BMW did. I never really felt like I was sitting there helpless. Like I couldn't move. And at the same time, th there was power available somewhere. So like, you know, as long as it could find it and it, it was always able to, with those nice Nokia and snow tires, it could get going. So yeah, thumbs up on that, on that front. And then of course, you know, took the Jeep out after that on the outposts and that thing, I mean, that was not driving around trees, it was driving over trees. So mm. it was a kind of a best of both worlds experience for me. But yeah, uh, so far this, I'm in, I think about week three with the BMW now, I'll probably do a uh, long-term update on that to talk about the snow stuff here in the next week or two. So keep an eye out for that. I had a lot to talk about with this car. I was a little surprised at first, and it was in a different way than I thought. Like going into it, I was like, this is going to be great. Get a three series. I like the three series. Uh, it's a plug in hybrid. And, you know, I, I did an update where I basically, like, the headline was like, I have thoughts. I'm conflicted, you know, just because I, so I don't have a level two charger. So I was using the level one kind of trickle charger, if you will, filling it up a lot more than I thought I would be because I didn't realize just how like usably small the fuel tank is. 
So um, it was kind of all over the place with it. I think if we do have a level two charger, like you and Zach, road test editor Zach Palmer, for those of you listening at home, uh, had setups and you could charge your charge your BMW and you're good to go. Whereas I was kind of more at the, the mercy of running the, the charger out of my garage to the car. And I'll admit part of this is my garage is a little messy, so I couldn't pull the BMW all the way in. So, you know, I've, I've said this before, I'm not, you know, hammering the infrastructure or even totally the car, but say you live in an apartment or say you already have a couple cars, you know, like it's, it's not like a total unicorn situation. Let me put it that way. So, right. um, but yeah, that's a 330E. Let's go all electric EQE a sedan. What do you think? It's still interesting to, to, to drive EVs, especially back to back with gas burning cars, just because like it completely recalibrates your sense of performance. Like you go from, you know, a gasoline car with 400 horsepower and an electric car with 400 horsepower perform very, very differently. And the, the electric car is always going almost always going to feel quicker. I have to say almost because there are some manufacturers who are doing their best to kind of make their EV calibration feel more like gasoline. I don't know why. At Volkswagen, I think, would be the, the number one call out there. Just because you look at like the ID4, like it's zero to 60 is very much what you'd expect from any gas burning compact crossover. It's not what you'd expect from an electric. So it's it's very strange to go into these and think okay so i was in an eqe 350 formatic so it's the all-wheel drive but it's the base powertrain and you would think all right i mean a standard mercedes e-class is basically a german taxi cab right like it's not a not a phenomenally exciting vehicle yes it's luxurious especially the way they're equipped here but it's not like oh yeah that's a super sedan but the eqe the acceleration you get from it makes it feel like a much more powerful vehicle even though ultimately it really isn't and if you can be judicious with your your inputs, I mean, you can actually stretch the electric range on that a bit farther than it seems like you, you would be able to on paper. That all aside, it's just really impressive how well these things handle for being so heavy. And I, it sounds like we're apologizing for the weight of EVs when honestly, it's the thing that most of us probably hate the most about them. Mm -hmm. But uh, on the like enthusiast side, that is. And it's it's weird. Like It completely changes your sense of what a car is supposed to do and it's it spoils you in a sense because you get back out of an ev into something even like the 330e and the 330e by comparison feels gutless and so like that all aside it, it's it's really impressive what what mercedes is doing with this set of cars where the interior feels very mercedes it doesn't necessarily scream i'm an electric car everything about me is different treat me differently it's it's just a mercedes inside and it doesn't have the hyper screen setup that you get in the eqs so you're a little less overwhelmed by the kind of electronicness of everything it just feels a little more traditional and luxurious in the way mercedes is the flip side to that is you step out of it and look at it and it's this weird kind of like i keep saying this but the the 90s chrysler kind of like streamlined cab forward look which frankly Chrysler did a lot better in the 90s. <laughs> so it's like you can tell that this is an intermediate step, right? This is this is not what they expect the EV end game to look like. This is just what we can do now with what we have, especially and and we'll probably beat on them for a few more years about it. When you look at the European manufacturers who were responsible for the diesel emission scandals and all that and the fact that they were compelled to go EV more so than kind of choosing to go EV is evident when you see some of the cars they've built so far. Um, and I mean, there are a lot of like weird little things we could point to on that, but we could fill an entire podcast just with like malicious compliance from, yeah. from manufacturers. But I mean, it's, it, it really feels like the EQE is like, okay, this is, this is a complete vehicle, but it's not the ideal so it's it's very good for what it is, but it kind of makes me more curious to see what comes next, because we are getting so close to just holistically wonderful electric cars. There are just a few more obstacles that we still need to clear, and I think that car is a good example of how. I think it's interesting to just some of the, I almost think cultural pushbacks we might see towards EVs coming out of Europe. Like it's a very diesel oriented, like, you know, part of the world, you know, they, they literally at times they're like the split as far as like, you know, 
fuel, if you will, would be like inverse to what it was in the United States. Their market was very diesel heavy with a little bit of gasoline, whereas with us, diesel is like horse racing. It's like a novelty, if you will, outside of heavy duty trucks. And you even saw last this week that you know several nations, um, I think sort of led by Germany, are trying to form a consortium to push back against the EU's you know, ban on internal new internal combustion engines by 2035. So uh, to me, that's a situation that really bears watching because you're getting like pockets, like I think Paris, for example, wants to like ban cars within certain parts of the cities. And then other countries in parts of their countries where it's probably not all different than it is here are kind of saying, well, wait, wait, wait a minute. And some of it's technological, some of it's political. So, um, you know, we'll see where that lands. Yeah, and and John just did a John Snyder, our mm-hmm. electric editor, just did a a great op ed this week about the fact that while electric might be the answer for light passenger vehicles going forward, potentially you know as far forward as we can look right now, there's still room for other propulsion in the transportation sector. The problem is it probably just won't be for cars, cars like the e fuels and hydrogen. And the other things that that are still in development are still viable, but just not necessarily for cars. It'd probably be for for trucks and over the road shipping, that kind of thing. Maybe even you know intermodal transportation that we haven't really you know defined yet. But the idea being that yeah, electric is is great for for most people who need to commute, for most people who need to take short trips, for people who live in denser urban areas. But there are people, especially in the United States, because it is so large, who can't be served by electric infrastructure as it currently exists and may not be able to even in 10 or 15 years. So, you know, when you're dealing with a country that's as large and in many places as remote as ours, you need a multi-pronged approach. And I think he did a really good job of outlining like what that future could look like. So that's worth a read if you if you have not already come across that. Definitely check that out. Uh, definitely something to read maybe Saturday morning over your morning coffee or right now. Don't delay. Uh, go read it right now. Get to your phone. Um, we'll go back maybe to sort of like the middle, if you will, Toyota Sienna hybrid. It's a traditional hybrid. It's not a plug-in. It arrived on my doorstep uh, last week when the EV6 went away, maybe two weeks ago. My, I don't know about you, but my long-term loans are just flying. It feels yeah. like the EV6 showed up and it was gone. And um time's flying i guess right Um, yeah so but anyways the sienna is a plug-in hybrid uh it's very nice it's uh the platinum trim uh if you're wondering about the powertrain it's the 2.5 cylinder 2.5 liter four cylinder and then you've got three electric motors total system output is 245 horsepower that's with everything working at full force it's all-wheel drive and then the transmission is a cvt and e cvt if you will uh, for a hybrid in a minivan, it's 4,725 pounds, which is not terrible. I mean, for like this barge of a vehicle, it's, you know, not that we care about weights when it comes to minivans, but, you know, I've driven some of these things that feel like troop transporters, and this is, you know, it doesn't have that dynamic. It's not quite as maybe sporty to drive as like, I always thought the plug-in hybrid Pacifica actually was sporty air quotes to drive because it's. Like you just have a really good view of the road. The steering's pretty good. And then you get some of that electric help uh, upon takeoff. Uh, But overall, I'm liking it. I have been using it for preschool drop-off. Minivans are outstanding. Let me put it that way for things like that. The fact that I can, you know, just the sliding doors. If you have kids and you've forgotten just how much sliding doors can make your life better, I I urge you to go test drive a minivan because that is, that's really nice. Um... And the Sienna is in an interesting place, I think. You know, when you look across the segment, uh, there's a lot of things, you know, in it at this point, far more than there were four or five years ago. Uh, The fact that it's a hybrid is significant. Um, You know, we also have like the Pacifica hybrid is a plug-in. And then you've got the Sedona, which to me is kind of like the design play. I think it's the best looking minivan. Then, of course, the Honda Odyssey, which is... You see a lot of those on the road around here, too. I think you see the Pacifica and the Odyssey the most in Metro Detroit, which is really irrespective of nothing, but that just happens. It seems to be the market makeup. And I'd say this, they're all pretty good, to be honest. Uh, I've driven most of them. I think they're all very solid, incredible. 
Uh, I still tend to put, I think the Pacifica is near the top of the segment. Maybe it's the top, depending on how you can charge it and how much you're willing to drive around with a bunch of batteries once your charge runs down. Uh, then I tend to look at the Sienna and its hybrid application as being you know, right in there. It's very good. I think you lose some points because I think the interior is a little dull. Uh, the Chrysler is a little bit better. The Honda, I think, is a little bit better. But if you want a traditional hybrid, this is the one to get. So to me, that's been a really smart play for Toyota. I think they, um, I mean, it's the best Sienna I've ever driven, which, you know, I don't know if that's a compliment or not or a bad thing, but it's, it's not totally meant to be a diss. It's, it just is what it is. Um, and it does all the minivan things you want it to do very well. So, yeah. I'm looking forward to, to getting a shot at that just because obviously I don't have kids. So for me, it's going to be more of like, what kind of truck things can I do with a minivan? Because mm -hmm. I don't have a truck either. So, <laughs> and uh, that'll be a good opportunity to actually to, to see how it does in the, in the like goods hauling, I guess would be the, the best way to put it. See if I can uh, make some, some lows and Home Depot runs with that thing that are, that are worth writing about. I think that'll be fun. Yeah, and I think that's a good take too because um, while the market is frankly me, if you will, and people like me who want that, I think it's also good to really dive into the the functionality of these things too. You know, like how does it work if you're going to go load something up at Home Depot? How does it work? Um, you know, you get a bunch of different perspectives on these things too. Like, is this you know how does this look to somebody who maybe isn't looking at it, you know, the way I might look at it. So I think that's that's going to be interesting to get your take on it. Um, I will say this. I think the Sienna is probably the one of the worst looking in the segment. Design is subjective, but, you know, Sedona looks great because I think Kia is just crushing it with design. I think the Pacifica is a pretty good look, too. It's held up pretty well. They haven't done too much to it over the last few years. Um, I don't know, man. The Sienna, just it feels like it's got some almost like Lexus-y, design cues like those taillights. It seems a little overwrought, but also dull at the same time. Um, maybe who cares? It's a minivan. Who cares? But I don't know. Um, just design is subjective. And that's, you know, that's, I think, the one, the one downside. But if you want a hybrid and you want to like fill it up and drive for 500 plus miles and not even think about it and do so efficiently, I mean, this is your, this is your thing. I mean, it's after being in the EV6, which I had to charge a lot, and that's fine. And the again, the 330E, which I had to fill up and charge a lot. It's nice to get in a vehicle that just sips fuel, has a huge like fuel tank, and you don't even think about it. That's really nice. Um, I think it's interesting to look at hybrids and gas cars the way we look at electric vehicles, you know, so... So that's the Sienna. Uh, check that out. We have an update from Joel already on site. Uh, he was the first person to get behind the wheel and got some news. News slash features. Um, kind of a weird one out of Hellcat world. Uh, you wrote this one about the Durango Hellcat owner who is suing Stellantis because they're still selling Hellcat Durangos. Um, <laughs> to be fair, I don't know if they ever exactly said when, where they were going to stop. But, you know, anybody can lawyer up and file a lawsuit in this day and age. This is America. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, this one, this one's interesting. And I, um, if we have any lawyers who happen to be listening, if you are up on contract law and yeah. you would like to take a look at the article I wrote that went up on, it would have been Tuesday about the owner who wants to sue over this, uh, just take a look at my take. Let me know what you think. But the basic idea here is that essentially he the the owner is saying that dodge and, and specifically he's calling out tim caniscus who is their 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 brand ceo saying mm -hmm. that we're only going to build these for one year and i think the the line that came out when the when the the product was announced was they were only going to build them for the remaining six months of production for the 2021 model year or something like that and then they managed to extend production a little bit longer than that. So they built more 2021s than they said they were going to build. And then it went on hiatus for 2022, I believe. There, I don't think there was a 2022 model. 
And then now with 2023, they're bringing it back. And so the argument that the owner is making is essentially that the more of these are that Dodge builds, the less special the original ones become, which on face value, sure, that makes perfect sense. Like, yeah, you're, you're, you know, uniqueness <laughs> didn't used to mean that you could be more than one of them, but your car in modern parlance becomes less unique the more of them there are. Sure. I buy that. I think a lot of people would too. Whether it actually is on the level of like, the, this guy is saying he basically wants to sue for false advertising. And then the thing with advertising is you actually like, it has to be advertised, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't think anybody was like, Dodge was out actually publishing advertisements that said, we will only sell 1700s of these. Like, you know, like there's obviously some like wiggle room here, but there is this concept of promissory estoppel where if, somebody can prove that they were financially harmed by a promise, not something written in a contract, but just a promise, then ostensibly they can collect damages. So that's basically what this, this guy's argument is, is that I can, I, my, the value of my 2021 Hellcat is now lower because you have built more of them than you said you would. So I would like you to compensate me. That's the, that's, the long and short of it. Whether that's actually going to stick is a whole different thing. And this is a concept that, I mean, obviously it's been, it, it exists within US law. So it's something that's been tested before. And it's something that people have come across in uh, collectibles markets and things like that. If you play like Magic the Gathering, you know, the card game from the 90s, which still exists, believe it or not, there's a, a big uh, controversy surrounding cards that they promised to never print. But again, there's no contract. And it's something they've kind of tested the legal waters on before and it's gotten messy. And, you know, the fans, and it, as it turns out, don't really like the situation any more than the game producers do. And I'm sure in this situation, like I, I made a comment at the end of the article that I wrote that like, you know, the people who wanted a 2021 Durango Hellcat aren't upset that they're making more of them. It's the people who bought a Durango Hellcat who are upset that they're making more of them. So this is kind of a weird balancing act for, for Dodge and maybe kind of an example for other automakers to keep an eye on too. It's, you know, finding that line where, yeah, you want your cars to be desirable because that makes them, you know, big headliners. You can get basically like, free exposure out of a car you built 20 years ago if it ends up on bring a trailer or cars and bids or something like that tomorrow right like that's good for you because it boosts your your brand's kind of standing without you actually having to build or sell anything so there's value in the limited edition vehicles for dodge beyond what they get for a customer buying them the day they hit the showroom floor and you want to maintain that relationship with your fans. You want those buyers, those whales, especially who are going to come out and spend outrageous amounts of money on something new or special. You want that, but you also don't want to alienate the customers who can't afford it. Because if you're selling your limited edition cars to the same 15 people every time you do it, then that's not doing as much for your brand awareness as it would be if you were spreading them around a little bit. Like you want your, you want people to buy your cars. You want them to sell themselves. You know, you, you want people to see them on the street, want one and go buy another one. It's, it's, you know, it, it's free publicity. And obviously it's negative when you run into a situation like this and you know, the, it, it can be interpreted as shady, but it's it's really tough and it's it's a balancing act that i think has really only kind of come to light recently and something that was like was a, i think two three weeks ago there was a story about the two brand new z06 c8 corvettes that were listed one was on bring a trailer i believe and the other one on cars and bids neither one of them hit their reserve and one of them was being sold by a dealer one of them was being sold by a private owner and of course gm has this new rule now where if you try to flip a vehicle they can either curtail or cancel the warranty on them there's all sorts of weird stuff that makes it tricky to do so like the automakers are kind of locked in this battle with with their own customers where you know, obviously they want them to buy the cars and they would love for them to give them as much money as they possibly can for them. But at the same time, you know, you need to strike a balance where your cars are actually accessible to the people who want to buy them. And when you have people sort of monopolizing that channel as an additional layer on top of the dealers who already have a ton of leverage, it just makes for unhappy customers. And it, from conversations I've overheard from Dodge employees, like there are a lot of customers out there who are already upset with Dodge because a lot of 
Hellcats and stuff like that go missing from factories. Mm-hmm. As we've we've covered it, you know, they they're getting they're being stolen. You know, they they get chopped up for street racing and all that kind of stuff. Imagine you're the the person who's put a thirty five thousand dollar deposit down on a Durango Hellcat that you know for sure you're getting. It gets stolen from the plant. The dealer can't offer you a replacement. They give you your money back. Great, but you don't have a good story there. So, like, there are a lot of directions that that these companies are being pulled in trying to satisfy owners who just want nothing more than to give them money for desirable cars. And it's frustrating for everybody when you can't do that for annoying or stupid reasons like theft or the pandemic or, you know, things like that. So it's just another layer on this already crazy kind of resale market cake that we've been building over the past few years. It's interesting too, when I, uh, when I look at this, I kind of wonder if they they made a calculated decision. And clearly, this is hearsay. I can't speak to state of mind, if you will, since we're getting really law and ordery here. But I wonder if they were like, "Hey, we could get in trouble for saying we were going to sell this many, you know, units." But somebody's going to sue us. They probably won't. But if they do, let them let them do it because we're just going to, you know, we'll settle the case. We'll throw a couple grand at them. But then we're going to sell another X number of Durango Hellcats, and that's going to weigh balance out any little lawsuit. That's just the cost of doing business. So I can yeah. see that being like just a tactical response. Yeah, absolutely. And also, you have to figure too that, I mean, in order for for you to trigger this promissory estoppel situation, you have yeah. to demonstrate that it costs you money. And the only yeah. way you can do that is by selling the car. Because if you don't sell the car, then the value in that car is entirely theoretical because it its value is what the market will bear, right? So if you if, if this particular owner turns around and sells the car for $125,000, let's say, he would then have to make an argument that he could have gotten more for it had Dodge not built additional examples of the car. And proving not only that they could have gotten more, but how much more is very tricky because it's it's entirely hypothetical. It's like, yeah, if if they had built fewer of these, I could have maybe gotten another 25,000. How do you prove that? And that's the problem. So you'd have to go back to examples of cars that were sold before additional ones were built and try to kind of extrapolate the value of a sale years later. And I mean, you would be able to argue that maybe the car appreciated in that time. You might also be able to argue that the car depreciated in that time. So if there's a lot out there. It's it's not a simple matter of, hey, you promised you'd only make this many and now you owe me money. So I it's and like you said, like when you're dealing with volumes this small, even if this does turn into a class action suit, which is what this individual is hoping the class is by definition very limited because if they built it sounds like they built fewer than 2000 of the 2021 models that's a very small group of people to represent in a situation like this and how much leverage will you really get and again these are all people who are like you're going to have to demonstrate that you've been harmed financially and doing that i think is going to be the trickiest part for these people because the the number of them that have sold is going to work against them because the, the smaller the the kind of population you have to work with the more difficult it becomes to point out trends whether they're the kind of trend you're hoping for or the kind of trend or not so it's a it's going to be difficult and i think and and again i mean i'm not a lawyer and i would love to hear from somebody who is who wants to who wants to pick apart my argument if you've got anything for us on this, feel free to email me. You can uh, find me on our uh, blogger list on autoblog.com, byron.herd at autoblog.com if you'd like to reach out directly. It's interesting too. You're not a lawyer, but you sound like one. And I thought your link to the Cornell Law School, which I actually, their SEO must be really good. When I was looking up advertising, they were the first result. I'm like, oh, hey, look, this is just right next to the story Byron cited. Just as far as like sort of proving false advertising, the law itself is vague enough that it would seem they could probably meet that criteria, but how well they could meet that, you know, is is going to be tricky. And sort of the fourth, like fourth or fifth bullet point here is that there was a likelihood of injury to the plaintiff. I mean, kind of good luck with that, you know, and I don't really see that you have to sort of prove malice anywhere in this. It's a little bit different than say like, you know, journalism and media law. So, I mean, it's, 
it's going to be tough, I think, a very uphill battle for them to like just say the company made a different decision, you know, a year or two later. I mean, like, how do you make that literally a federal case? So, I mean, that's yeah. going to be tricky. And I think it's, it's interesting too. You speak of the value. Like, if this were like, I don't know, a super rare Shelby GT 500, 50 of them, they're signed by Parnelli Jones. That's one thing. At the end of the day, this is just a really high powered Durango. Like, it's entirely reasonable to think that this thing is not going to be worth more than it was um, just simply because there's a, a hell of a lot of Durangos, you know, rolling around. So, yeah, that, that could be tricky, too. And, a, and another angle that Dodge can always take with this, too. And, and it would be interesting to look back and see w- whether this is true. But if they made any changes to the car, even if they were like they offered mm-hmm. it in different paint colors or yeah. different options or they removed an option or something like that, if they can demonstrate that the 2023 is in any way materially different and it doesn't i don't even think it would need to be significant and again lawyers Mm -hmm. correct me if i'm wrong but like if they can say well the 2023 model does this little bit differently than the 2021 model so technically they're different and we did say we would limit the number of 2021 durango hellcats we would build but we didn't say anything about 2023 like you know like there there's gonna be wiggle room and they're gonna try to exploit it so yeah i mean it's rare that a vehicle changes over completely unchanged, even if it is essentially carryover, they change something, you know, even if it's just flashing the infotainment. So, um, you know, we'll see. It's, it's, it's interesting. And then to really dig into this, look at the precedent. I mean, how many car companies have said, Hey, we're going to do this limited edition model. Oh, Hey, everybody snapped them up. Let's do 500 more. Let's do another one. You know, the Ford GT comes to mind, you know? Um, yeah. It's interesting because normally the owners are just so happy to get the car. They don't lawyer up and sue, you know, but in this case, it's like, I don't know. It's a very interesting story. We don't see too many class action lawsuits in the car business related to product. Usually it's when somebody gets hurt or usually when somebody gets hurt or like recalls. Exactly. Um, So I don't know. I think this is could be a good one for an update. Who knows? You know, good one to maybe get a hold of the lawsuit. All right. Wow. That really, uh, that just makes me think, when is the next episode of Law and Order coming up? Yeah. They usually come out on Thursdays. Uh, it's Wednesday. So, uh, staying with Dodge here, let's talk a little bit about the Hornet. Disclaimer, Byron drove it uh, last week. We're not going to talk impressions. We'll probably get to that in a future podcast, driving impressions. But he's free to talk about everything else that happened. Um, so, how was the trip? This is the first big Dodge trip you or really any of us have been on in some time. I imagine there weren't some lawyers for this other guy crawling around looking for <laughs> statements, but how, how was it? It was a very, very nice drive. We went to Asheville, uh, North Carolina, nice. which is not, not the kind of place you would think of for this kind of thing. Normally, especially this time of year, it's, oh, we're off to California to drive the whatever it is. So it was a nice change of pace. Asheville is a, a beautiful, beautiful little town, a great like college town feel. It does not feel like the Carolinas. It's a, it's a mm. very strange kind of like hippie enclave in the mountains. It's delightful. It was a, it was a wonderful place to, to drive. And they have beautiful roads out there, which were great for a, a drive event. We really got to put the car through its paces. It's, I think the, the, the thing with, with Hornet, <laughs> there are a lot of things. There's going to be a lot to cover next week. So it, on Wednesday, when this goes live, you'll be able to read all about it. But the, the key here is that it, Dodge hasn't built a small, compact crossover vehicle like this before. This is kind of new to them. And so, of course, they, they've drawn on Alfa Romeo, which has its own new vehicle it's doing. And it's also closely related to the Jeep Compass. But they made some interesting choices with it. We've got you, you basically have your option of turbo or turbo plus electric. And there's there's no, you know, quote unquote base engine for this. The base engine is that 258 horsepower turbo and you get all wheel drive. So it is for Dodge, at least what seems to be a very premium product and one that kind of flips the script on what you would expect from Dodge. And it's going to be. Interesting to see the split on buyers between the base turbo engine and the plug-in hybrid. There is a pretty big spread between them price-wise. There's not a big spread between them power-wise. In fact, depending on how you're driving the plug-in hybrid, it actually produces less horsepower 
than the standard turbo version. And again, I'm being very cagey with my language here because there you know, we get into you know what's a driving impression versus what's just the numbers. If you actually break down the numbers on the plug-in hybrid, the actual power output is about the same as the standard turbo model, but it takes advantage of a feature that momentarily increases the output. It's very similar to the Ford Focus ST's overboost in that the I believe the ST was rated 240 horsepower. That figure included overboost. So that was not the the all the time power output. That was when the engine was running cool enough and all the systems checked out, it would unlock those extra few pounds of pressure and give you the full 240 horses. The Hornets plug-in feature that allows for the full advertised power works very similarly, only it uses the electrical components of the car rather than the turbos to do it. So think of it as like a momentary overboost only it's power that's being extracted from the battery rather than asking your turbines to work over time. There's a weight penalty for the plug-in. So the car is obviously significantly heavier with that big battery pack. All of these things combine to create two very different cars. That's really all I can say at this point about it. But I'm I'm really interested to see how people react to, first of all, the the power output of the base model, which when you look at the new Jeep Compass with its 200-ish horsepower version of the same engine, the 2.0 liter inline four, that's that's what says base engine to me. So it's this is kind of a Stellantis way of saying the Compass somehow is the entry level for their compact crossovers with Dodge then slotting in between that and Alpha, which is not the hierarchy I think most of us would have expected. Normally, like we think of Jeep as being the slightly premium alternative to a Dodge in any cases where they overlap. And in this case, that script is flipped a bit because you would think of like the Grand Cherokee, especially with the previous generation that lined up a little more closely with the Durango. It was a two row that cost as much as a three row Durango. So you were expecting premium content, higher quality materials, all that kind of stuff from Grand Cherokee that you wouldn't necessarily expect from a Durango. So if you draw that same parallel between the Compass and the Hornet, it's reversed. So the Hornet is the premium entry. The Hornet has the power. The Hornet is the more interesting one. So like, it's weird that they did it. It's going to be interesting to see how it plays out. And it's also, it, you have to kind of feel for Dodge's product planners just a little bit because had the Inflation Reduction Act not included all the provisions for domestic production of the electric components to qualify for tax rebates, the plug-in hybrid Hornet could have been a lot cheaper than it's going to be. So that, if you lease, you can still take advantage of it. So if you're leasing, you can get the plug-in and it's a lot less expensive. So maybe that makes it more worthwhile. If not, if you're buying, it's a, it's a large price discrepancy between the two of them that may not necessarily be reflected in even the numbers. So again, that's, that's, right up against the limit of what I'm allowed to talk about before we get around to uh, next Wednesday. But I encourage you all to check it out, especially if you're interested in this segment. It is going to be the most powerful base mainstream compact crossover out there. The numbers there, that's not giving away anything you don't already know or couldn't already find out today. So keep that in mind and uh, we'll uh, we'll come back to this in a, in a bit. Yeah, no, check it out. I think... Um... You know, maybe I'll be your lawyer here and I'll urge you to stop talking. Um, <laughs> we'll just, you know, we'll leave it out there. But uh, I'm very intrigued to drive this thing myself. I think it looks pretty good. I think Dodge has had some success in the past. Um, like the Dart was essentially an Alfa Romeo uh, platform and it even vaguely looked a bit Alfa. They've had some success, um, you know, sort of using, sharing some of the platforms and technology between those two brands. So, um more on that to come. And Hornet, I think, is a great name. You know, they almost used it before. Um, Jesus is probably 14, 15 years ago. Yeah. Uh, they were going to make it a small car. It was going to be like a rebadged Nissan. And as part of that deal, they were going to trade the Ram pickup to Nissan. You probably remember this. It was like yeah. right before bankruptcy when they were desperate to get like a fuel efficient car in their lineup and they had no way to do it, basically. So they... Uh, you know, that was like the trade they were offering up. The The Nissan was going to be called the, 
you know, the Hornet and they were going to the next Titan would have been Ram based, which, man, talk about footnotes in history. I mean, that would have really screwed like Stellantis. It was then Chrysler and Nissan would have a very different conversation about its full size pickup truck game. Uh, Let's put it that way. I don't know if people would have flocked to Nissan knowing that it was a Ram. Hard to say, but man, what a strange chapter in history that was. And I think Sergio Marchione came on board. And that was one of the first things he did is he's like, oh, hell no, we're not doing that. Yeah. Uh, you want a small car? We, we can get that Fiat 500 over here. You can sell that at some of these dealerships. Yeah. That'll make the government happy. It's all good. Whoever was in charge of that deal hit the road. Uh, we're going to shred these contracts. Dunzo. Yep. So that's the and of course, the Hornet has a great history before that. Uh, well, a lot of it's good. Let's put it that way. Some of it's not so good, but it's a storied history, I guess. Yeah, this is true. All right. Kia EV9 um, just dropped yesterday, late in the day. Brett Burke saw it. He's one of our contributors. Uh, He's got some really nice um, design observations in this piece as well. This is interesting. You know, we've both driven the EV6 and now we're seeing how they're going to, you know, scale up to larger vehicles. All we know is how it looks, Um, you know, and it's we're basically getting it sort of secondhand, too. But it looks pretty good. You know, there was some chatter this morning in Slack about the interior. Uh, it's, I, I can't get a good read on it myself as far as that, but looks good. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, that's pretty much where I am on it right now. I, I think they chose the wrong interior to show for this, for the debut vehicle. Just the, the lack of contrast, the all, all gray tone, everything kind of gives it that sort of like early 90s concept car look to mm-hmm. it. Like it looks yeah. like it could be the interior of a of a of a of an expensive and fast boat, and not necessarily a pretty one. So I don't know. Like it, it really, honestly, I'm I'm not trying to criticize because I, the design looks fine and the the whole idea of basically it just being a longer EV6 works perfectly. Like it doesn't need to be anything but a three row EV6. So you know the the bar is not set particularly high on this one. It's a family hauler. It, it doesn't need to set the world on fire, but Certainly promising for what we've seen so far. I just like a better look at a at a, perhaps a, an interior with a bit more contrast to it. Sounds good. Sounds good. A, you know, family hauler. I mean, you've got my attention. So let's let's see. Uh, then we'll close out this kind of news feature section uh, with Rivian appears to uh, have its deal with Amazon. This is for a hundred thousand delivery vans. It may be over now. Uh, one of our contributors, uh, Stephen Williams, who's done some work for the New York Times, um, you know, wrote this one up. Uh, we're kind of aggregating this one actually off the Wall Street Journal. Um, we'll see. This was a big deal uh, because it gave Rivian sort of credibility back in 2019 when there was some talk that you know Ford did end up taking a big stake in them. They kind of edged out General Motors. Rivian really was the the hottest thing, you know, three or four years ago. And now, as you look at some of the stock prices and the you know, just a number of vehicles they've produced, um, like many of their like ilk. It's I wouldn't say the, the the bloom is off the rose, but people are looking at some of these like new EV makers a little more cynically. Like, hey, where's my car, man? That kind of thing. So yeah. um, this though originally was one of the paths on their like the touchstones on their path to like legitimacy is they had this deal with Amazon. Um, We'll see. I mean, the other thing is maybe they don't need it, but it it always seemed a little one-sided in that it was exclusive for Rivian, but not exclusive for Amazon, because why would Jeff Bezos ever do that, right? I mean, I I think he knows how to make a dollar or two. Why would he ever agree to like put all of his, you know, delivery footprint in the, you know, the hands of his company that at that point hadn't even made a thing? But we'll see. Maybe it's mutually beneficial. I I don't know. Yeah, they're kind of spinning it as... Rivian having the opportunity to branch out and and explore other arrangements. And I mean, that's true, but I can't help but wonder if they'd rather just have all those guaranteed sales (laughs) rather than opportunities, you know? So yeah, that it'll be interesting to see how that, how that kind of pans out. Yeah. I clearly Rivian would need Amazon more than Amazon needs Rivian, obviously. Um, I don't know. I, I, speaking of lawyers who have like really guest starred in this podcast, I wonder if somebody told them, hey, you, you can't really fight this exclusivity part of the deal. You might just want to try to get out of it. On the other hand, like, I don't really think there's that many 
companies, especially of the size and scale of Amazon, that are going to line up and say, hey, Rivian, let's go. Yeah. You know, um, especially when you see like the Postal Service just signed a deal with Stellantis for ICE and with mm -hmm. Ford for EV. So like one of the best opportunities they would have had is already off the table. Yeah, that's a really good point. That's a good point. Uh, OK, should we spend some money? Let's do it. All right. Let me. This is a good one. Dave writes, I have another spend my money request. Thanks for writing back in, Dave. And this may be a unique one. Currently lease a company car and he's changing jobs. So I have to turn the car back in on my last day. My new employer also offers a car company lease program, but it may take four to five months to arrive after he orders it just because it's 2023. Evaluating options to cover me in the interim. My wife has her 2011 Nissan Rogue and he has his 05 911 Carrera S manual. This was the third car. Here are the options. Option one, get by by daily driving the 911 for several months. He has two sons in booster seats and they still fit in the back of the 911. I have a booster seat. I haven't tried that in the back of the 911. That's, that's interesting. Plus he has a roof rack in case he needs to move cargo when the Rogue is not available. He doesn't mind the extra mileage and the wear and tear on the 911. I say more power to you, man. I think use your stuff, you know? I mean, don't worry about some of the extra mileage wear and tear, if you will. Option two, buy a cheap $10,000 practical vehicle like an older Toyota, Lexus, SUV, or minivan. Use it, then sell it. Minimizes the mileage and wear and tear for the 911. Option three, find a reliable-ish four-door, unique, fun, quirky, practical vehicle, also for about 10 grand to use for several months and then sell it. He closes with, I don't know if this unicorn exists. What other options am I not thinking of? Signed, Dave. So thanks, Dave. Um, my initial thought right here, and I don't want this to sound lazy, is maybe just keep, see how far you can ham and egg it with the 911. Uh, it sounds like you've got a system in there that does work. It's probably not gonna be ideal. Maybe you get the company car sooner than you think. Um, it seems like by the time you actually go to the trouble of researching and buying another car, you could be pretty close to getting that other car. And then what do you do? Now, the downside to my proposed option is you probably could make some money if you found something decent and flipped it. On the other hand, if you find something decent that, does, that isn't as decent as you think, you could end up making it a money pit. It's very hard to find anything for $10,000. So uh, over to you, Byron. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I think in, in that position, like granted, Used values are so stable right now that you probably could get away with buying a secondary vehicle and selling it for what you paid or maybe even a little more or at least not losing that much. I agree. The thing is, with the window being so uncertain and everything really being so uncertain, I, it, I would hesitate to buy another car unless you thought it was something you might actually see value in keeping long term, even after you replace it with the company car. Um, that way, just in case for whatever reason, you know, things change in the next few months, it's something you can live with, right? You know, it's not, you're not committing to it entirely, but at least you're saying, well, you know, it, it, whatever happens, I, I wouldn't be miserable driving this indefinitely, you know, and that makes it kind of a tougher purchase decision. And at $10,000, if that's kind of what you're hoping for, I mean, you know, like an older BMW wagon, something like that might be a good, like, kick around car for just a few months. I would hesitate to overspend on something like I would assume Toyota Lexus are being floated for their kind of sturdy resale value and their and their kind of strong reputation where you feel like you can buy a Toyota or a Lexus and in whatever shape it's in. And it's still probably worth whatever you paid for it in a few months because nothing's going to go wrong, right? And that's probably going to be true of really anything you buy because that's a really narrow window, especially if you're not going to be putting a ton of miles on it. But it's it's like this is basically describing why I bought the Matrix when I bought the Matrix two years ago. It was a, a practical vehicle that I could use when I wasn't driving my Challenger or my Jeep. Because those were both, you know, two door. Sure, they're four seaters, but nobody wants to ride around the back of either one of those if you can help it. So the Matrix made a little sense in that, like, well, if I decided I didn't like it all that much, I could flip it. Or if, if I decided it was worth keeping, it's the kind of car you can keep for a while and, and, and not worry about it sitting, you know, because it's Toyota Matrix. 
it's a Corolla. So, you know, if if you think you can you can get away with it, sure. But I'm I just don't know what cars to suggest, especially because it sounds like you're trying to avoid falling in love with this thing, which means you probably just you know it's 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 a utility play. And I, I, I think my advice would be start with the 911. And if you realize that that's more than you want to do to that car, then worry about it, you know, because maybe you get through the 911, you do two months with the 911, you realize it's not a good fit. And you say, OK, well, I parked that. Can I get by for three months on Uber and Lyft or whatever? You know, is 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 there an option out there for me? I mean, you might even be able to find a dealer who would, you know, do a short term deal on a, like a lease, basically. So, like, you know, you never know. There, there are options out there. But I this is this is a tough one just because of the, the how narrow that window is. It's interesting too. You mentioned like a short term lease. I think you could, I mean, you could also look at like Turo or one of these kind of like sort of newer like rental leasing things. See if you could just do maybe like a, like literally rent a car, you know, maybe see how far you could get in the 911, then see how much farther out your company car is and make like a tactical in between play. You know, looking at like a $10,000, just whatever. Uh, some interesting lists out there. I came across one on cars.com. Um, like if you were looking to go for like a sedan, you could maybe try to grab a Fusion, which you probably would be willing to get rid of pretty quickly. You might get find a Mazda 6. You know, these are like 10, 12-year-old cars. You might end up liking the Mazda 6, and that's a pretty functional car. Design is a little dated, but it was good for its time. It handles pretty well. It's got a big trunk. You might decide you just want to keep that, and then it becomes like a you know, you have a you have your 911, then you have the the Rogue, and you have this practical Mazda. Uh, that does go down a little bit more of the commitment road. There's a good story on KBB from our friend Nelson Ireson, um, who's done some freelance work for us, uh, where he's got some of the SUVs on here. This is one where I think you get a little more, you could get a little wilder. Uh, you know, you could go with like a Nissan Xterra, like one that's like 10 years old. That was kind of like blocky and SUV like, or like, you know, an eight, nine, 10 year old Subaru Outback. And you might decide, that's a good list, by the way. Um, that the Outback is one that you you might just like. To me, that could be one you get in there and you drive it for five years and it becomes part of your rotation. Maybe you're, it's a little bit newer than the Rogue and your wife decides to unload the Rogue. That could maybe be a good car swap. Um, or like, you know, you like the Xterra. You know, you just, you get in like a 10-year-old off-road style vehicle and you're like, oh man, you can't get this too much anymore. And Jeeps and Broncos are super expensive. Maybe I you roll around in that and feel kind of like the cool dad. That could be fun. And I'm looking at a couple of the, I was suggesting the BMWs. You can find, well, looks like 328i's in the like 2007 to 2009 range. But, and these are going to be under 10,000, but you're, you're going to be getting them with miles. You'll be getting at least 120, 150,000 miles, it looks like. But, I mean, those older ones, at least, they get that naturally aspirated inline six. So the yeah. potential for issues is much smaller than it would be with maybe a modern compact turbo engine. So an older BMW like that may not be a money pit. It might actually, it might actually be a good fit for something like this, especially if you want it to be, you know, different, but, you know, at least conventional enough that you know you can take it just about anywhere to get it serviced. That's a good take too, because if you did get like, say, a BMW wagon of that kind of vintage, you yeah. might decide you really like it. And then that just becomes like a fun investment. And those things, I think, with the number of miles, you know, it's, you're probably not going to be able to flip it for more money, but there's always going to be a market for people who want like a BMW wagon. So it's not going to go to zero. Let's put it that way. That could be a fun approach too. So. So we've given you a lot of ideas, Dave. Um, let us know what you do. Thanks for writing back. Um, it is spring. We're on the cusp of March Madness. What are you going to do this weekend, Byron? You got any spring beers? Are you got to watch basketball? Are you much of a hoops guy for college? Uh, I, I I do enjoy March Madness. I don't actually have any plans for it this weekend. I'm I'm actually going to take advantage of our newfound daylight savings time and go get at the the lawn a little bit. I think because mm. there's still a lot of uh, new to this property type stuff that I need to be taking care of. So I've got a, a, a whole lot of dirt back there that I'm trying to turn green. And <laughs> this is, uh, we're starting to get to the time of year where it's kind of uh, optimal to start trying to fill that in. 
Well, speaking of turning green, I am a you know proud Michigan State alumni. So this is the time of the year where we really care about basketball because you know quite frankly it's usually Final Four or bust for us, and it has it's been bust a lot lately. So we'll see. Uh, hopefully it's hopefully it's a good run, but we'll see. By the time this podcast drops, we may be already out of the tournament. Um, <laughs> we'll see. You never know. You never know. Um, so uh, if you enjoy the show, please leave us five cars. Five cars? That would be great. Give us five cars. I'll take three, send one to Byron and one to Dave. (laughs) That would be five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever the hell you get this show. Send us your Spend My Monies. That's podcast at autoblog.com. Be safe out there. Cheers. Cheers.